Welcome back to the DFS build. I'm Kevin Roberts, joined with Taylor Smith. Taylor, how are you feeling about coming back from that horrendous break? I was diving into NHL DFS over here. How about you? As was I. And now I'm <laughs> happy to not play it for a while again. Yeah, so I'll be full fading the D- NHL, NHL DFS, which, by the way, I actually did uh, like 4x my money on one of my entries for NHL by using an optimizer, the very one they're going to be using today. But uh, for anybody new, we are uh, Taylor Smith, Kevin Roberts. Uh, we're doing the NBA DFS build where we break down each game and uh, help you build your lineups by pointing out the best plays that we like. Uh, today, we're going to be going over the 10-game slate for Thursday, February 22nd. Obviously, we're coming back from the All-Star break. For the most part, we're not looking at a ton of injury news. We shouldn't be too concerned about that because people use the break to get healthy, and there's no real reason for new new injuries to pop up. That said, we will touch on the ones that uh, do stand out that could have an impact on this slate. Uh, this video is sponsored by DFS Hero. They have a nice, versatile lineup optimizer and plenty of features that can help you get a TPP takedown. I actually literally use their tool for the NHL contest I placed decently in. So uh, it, it's a solid tool to use. Right now, you can get 15% off when you use our link, which is in the video description below. All right, we got to get to it, though. It is a 10-game slate. Lots to talk about. We will get the worst game out of the way immediately. The Cavs uh, host the Magic. Cleveland will be eight and a half point favorites with a disgusting 217 total. Uh, I believe on the Orlando side, uh, Paulo Bancaro is questionable to play, and Markel Fultz is out. That's it for the Magic side. Taylor, starting with Orlando, who do you like in this game? I think Wagner looks like the only one that's really playable if Paolo's in. Um, obviously, Paolo being out would give him quite a boost in usage. Um, matchup's awful, though. They do have a really low total, and we are paying full price for Franz, so I think it'd be a fine play, but I'm not sure he'd be a core play if Paolo Bancaro's out. Um, <clears throat> I do think we'd have value, though. Joe Ingles and Jonathan Isaac, I guess, would be the ones that presumably see uh, minutes boosts. Both are under 4K. Um you know, it's Joe Ingles and Jonathan Isaac. It's hard to get too excited about either of them, but punts are punts. And even against the Cavs, I think they'd be playable. Otherwise, not seeing a ton here. I guess Suggs with Fultz out looks okay, but not dying to get there. Um, yeah, it's pretty gross, honestly. Yeah, it's not a spot that I'm liking at all. The game total kind of tells us all we need to know. I will agree on Suggs, maybe even Cole Anthony at 4.1. They're viable. Uh, but they're not really guys I'm looking to get to. Wagner's totally fine if Boncaro's out. If Boncaro is in, I don't really want either of them. I will note that if Boncaro's out, I agree. Isaac at 3.5K looks awesome. I was looking at at him anyways, regardless of Boncaro, because he is going to get 15 to 20 minutes. He is averaging 1.05 fantasy points per minute. So he is a good play based off of value that is out there. Uh, well, good is a relative term, is it not? Uh, But he's he's a fine value Either way, and I think he's a pretty good uh, value if Bancaro is indeed out. But the matchup sucks. Uh, on the other side, you have the Cavs, led by Donovan Mitchell, who projects not really as good as he normally does. He is questionable for this game, but he was at shoot around, so I'm anticipating he plays. Obviously, if he's out, that opens up a lot of usage. So how are you feeling about Spida and the rest of the Cavs? Yeah, uh, they said Mobley and, and Garland are no longer limited. So I think Mobley for 6-7 looks underpriced. Um like we said, not the best environment here. Uh, low total game, two good defensive teams, but Mobley's just underpriced for the role he could play tonight. Um, you get more usage if Mitchell's out. Garland for 5-9 looks pretty good either way, just because he's normally about 7K, and he's a 1,000 less than that here, with allegedly no more limit. If uh, Mitchell's out, then Garland is maybe the best play on the whole slate. So there's potential here. I think both are playable either way. Uh, both become even bigger priorities if Mitchell is out. Yeah, with no minutes limit, Mobley and Garland kind of look tough to fade here. It is a big slate. It's not a good matchup. Magic are slow and play good defense. I mean, both these teams are bottom 10 in pace and top five in defense. This is not a place to go for a DFS environment. Uh, So, yeah, I'm with you for the most part, but the prices on Garland and Mobley are very tough to get away from. And if Spida is out, I would think at that point, Garland becomes a core play at 5.9K. And we can also look at Karis LeVert at 4.8. Uh, worth noting, Garland does see a 4% usage bump with Spida out. Um, that should surprise nobody, obviously. So 
Yeah, it really depends on what happens with Mitchell. If Mitchell is in, I probably am going to ignore this team a whole game if I can. Uh, but Garland is, is still going to be tough to fade. Uh, moving on, we do have the Pistons and Pacers. Really big 11.5 point spread with Indy favored at home. Uh, hefty 247.5 total. So hypothetically great DFS environment. Uh, the only problem is that disgusting spread and the Pistons are terrible. So um, assuming this game stays close, who are you liking on the Detroit, st- the Detroit side to get started here? Uh, it's a good spot for Duran just because the Indiana allows the most points in the paint per game. Duran's 7K, though. He's not necessarily coming at a discount. I think Cunningham looks pretty good in tournaments. 7-6 is cheap relative to what we've been paying for most of the season. A uh, good pace-up spot for them, too. They do have a, a 117 total, so that's pretty high for the Pistons, even if they are big underdogs in this one. I'd have interest there. Um, I suppose Fontecchio, just because he's been playing minutes, is worth a shout if you enter multiple lineups, but ideally not diving there. Um, I think it's really probably just Cade for me uh, on this team right now. Yeah, no arguments there. Cade has a 29% boom rating at DFS Hero. Projects decently. Good price. Duran too. Both these guys have done well against the Pacers in two meetings this year. Duran is averaging 39 fantasy points across those two games and Cade at 41. So uh, these guys do have a ceiling. So they are pretty interesting. The spread is a little bit troubling. But um, if they make their way into my lineups, I'm not that sad about it. One other guy I would point out is Azar Thompson at 5K flat. He's pushing for 30 minutes on a consistent basis. So right there with Fontecchio, he is a little bit more expensive, um, but he projects better, has a better boom rating, and just is the better player, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah, I like him a little bit uh, with this matchup, but I'm not exactly forcing him in because he is not super cheap. On uh, the other side, obviously, of the Pacers, Tyrese Halliburton no longer limited. I believe it's no longer limited. He's He's been up to 34 minutes in each of his last two games, and he was just ticking around at the All-Star weekend. So I got to think he's totally fine. Um, let's check real quick the injury report for them. Aaron Naismith is out, and uh, Jalen Smith is questionable. So that could open up a little bit of usage uh, off the bench uh, for some of the Pacers guys. Uh, but how are you feeling about him in this matchup? Good. I mean, they have a 129-point total, so it's kind of hard to ignore. Uh, Halliburton for 9-4, still underpriced. He was, I think, 8,900 last time we played him, and he was a smash, and the spot's comparable. Um, he's, you know, a 10K player when he was at his peak earlier in the year, so... Still an underpay there. Um, Neesmith being gone should open up minutes, presumably. Uh, Matherin and Nimhard are the ones that look like they'll benefit the most. Matherin's going to be really popular, it looks like, for 4 or 5, but don't really have any complaints with it. Um, path to 30 minutes for him, uh, at least. Miles Turner, another one, kind of like Duran. Um, minutes for him have been shaky all year, so it's not the most comfortable play, but if he's going to be chalky, it's someone to consider fading. If his ownership comes down, uh, heading closer to lock, I think I'm interested in tournaments on Miles Turner. Yeah, I mean, Halliburton looks awesome, pushing for almost 50 fantasy points on this slate with a 31.8% boom rating. He looks great at 9.4. It's going to be really tough to not use Halliburton, especially if you're doing one lineup. Um, yeah, I'm with you across the board here. Pacers look awesome. Everybody you pointed out looks really good. Um, I guess you could go to somebody like Nemhard with Naismith out, but mostly I'd be looking at Matherin, Halliburton and Miles Turner. Siakam is the guy who's getting overlooked here because he's not going to project as well as Halliburton uh, and he's way more expensive than Turner. But I mean, at 8.2, is Siakam a bad play? I don't think so. I think he's plenty fine. And by the way, all these guys, it's a little bit tough to look at because Siakam was with Toronto, obviously, for much of the year. But Halliburton, Turner, and Siakam all have averaged 45 plus fantasy points in the in the multiple games they played against Detroit. So we know this matchup is awesome. So I don't think you can really go wrong here as far as arguing for uh, Pacers. Uh, moving on to the Knicks and Sixers. This game is in Philly. The Sixers are one-point favorites, which is a little bit surprising to me since they have not been very good without uh, Joel Embiid. But obviously, yeah, and he remains out. So it's a little surprising that they're favored. Uh, Julius Randle remains out for the Knicks. OG Ananubi is out as well. Bojan is – he'll be back. He's probable. And Isaiah Hartenstein is listed as probable. So – they are without two key contributors uh, for the Knicks, um, but otherwise they've been the team that we've been looking at for the past two weeks. So how do you feel about them in this spot? Not great. Um, they generally look overpriced at this point. 
for the roles with the injuries, and they did get those guys at the deadline, so they're not as shorthanded as they were back when they had like eight or nine guys with Miles McBride and all that. So Brunson for 9-3 I think is fair. Um, without Embiid, obviously Philly's not nearly as stingy, but as a whole, I think I'm not dying to get to anything here other than Brunson. I think he's a good differentiator, especially as a pivot from Halliburton for 100 bucks less. I don't mind that at all. Yeah, 100% agree. I believe Brunson is like top five in usage in February too, you know, obviously prior, prior to the All-Star game. So uh, that has not gone away. That's not going to go away just because they added Burks and Bojan either. Um, but yeah, all these other guys are priced up uh, given their old roles. But now that they're getting closer to full strength as a, a whole roster, it's Brunson or bust for me. On the other side, we have the Sixers, who are obviously led by Tyrese Maxey, who has monstrous usage with Embiid sidelined. Um, I think, well, Tobias was on the injury report, but he's not. De'Anthony Melton remains out, and Nicholas Batum is questionable. That's really all you need to look at for the Sixers. So who stands out here for you? Yeah, if Tobias had been out, I would have been interested in Buddy, but 6-7 for Buddy with Maxey and Tobias in feels like a lot. Um, he's scoring dependent, shooting dependent, very low floor there. Um I think you can still go there if you're playing multiple lineups in a tournament and hope his shots are falling, but it's not my favorite thing to do. Uh, Maxi is kind of like Brunson, just the pivot from Halliburton uh, thing. 9-1 is not necessarily too much. Should lead the team in usage without Embiid. But not the best spot, not the greatest game environment here, even with the uh, tight one-point spread. So, you know, it's hard to prioritize anything here. They're basically healthy except for you know, Embiid and a couple of guys who've been out for a while. So it's not really an inefficiently priced team at this point. So not much yeah. to see here. Yeah, I mean, on a 10-game slate, you don't want to necessarily use a guy just to use a guy. You don't want to get different just to get different ever. I think you always should have a pretty good reason as far as why you're making that pivot. Halberton is just a way better play than Maxi on this given slate. And with the Sixers at, you know, relative uh, full strength besides Embiid being out, um, just nobody stands out. So if you don't have a reason to do it and nobody stands out, I just don't think you have to go there. If you're if you're running a, if 20 maxi in a small GPP or 150 maxi, yeah, you can try to uh, uptick your exposure to Kelly Oubre, Paul Reed, Buddy Heald, and all these guys, but they just do not stand out as priorities. If I had to play one, it would be maxi because he is kind of too cheap for his role. Um, all right, on to the Nets and Raptors in Toronto. Uh, the Raptors are two-point favorites. This is a nice 231.5 total. I will uh, point out that the Nets just fired Jacques Vaughn, so they're uh, having Kevin Ollie take over. We have no idea what that's going to mean. Uh, he's made some weird comments about Cam Thomas, like his defensive effort and rebounding and all this. So uh, do we have to be a little bit concerned that Cam Thomas's role is uh, somewhat in jeopardy or just not as concrete? Maybe. And we just don't know what the team's going to look like with Ollie there. So uh, starting on the Nets side, uh, what, are you, what are you thinking here? Yeah, this is kind of just a differentiator team. It's not a bad spot. Like Toronto's been really bad defensively since their trades. So um, Mikhail Bridges for 7-3, Ben Simmons for 5-6. I don't think are bad individual plays. Simmons, we've seen his kind of stat stuffing upside even in limited minutes. Um, should play around 24 here. I don't think he's a bad option. Um, but hard to prioritize anybody. Uh, Bridges is probably the guy I'll have the most exposure to. But that's probably just a dusting, like maybe 5% of my lineups will have them. So not the most alluring team, even if it is a decent on-paper spot. No, per usual, just nobody pops. They don't project very well. The highest projection is 35.9 fantasy points with Mikel Bridges. So it's like, and, and the highest. They just have a lot of bodies vying for minutes. And yeah. They, you know, it's not great. Like you obviously can argue because of the matchup, um, yeah. but it's just nobody looks great. There's nothing, there's nothing concrete indicating that you have to play anybody here. I will say uh, Nick Claxton at 6.9, that price is pretty appealing, but I mean, I don't really love targeting Jakob Pertl. He's not like a bad defender or anything. So yeah, not really looking at nets, but if you get to them, I mean, they're just fine. Uh, moving on with the Raptors, Scotty Barnes has had two massive games out of his last three contests. Um, is that the Scotty Barnes we can now expect? And who do you else, do, who else do you like for Toronto tonight? Yeah, I think he and Barrett look pretty good. Um, both maybe a tick too cheap for the roles they play, but it's not egregious either way. Um, Barnes will be the guy I get the most to most of here at eight eight. Um, point guard, small forward eligibility comes in handy too. Makes it easy to cram him into builds 
with those positions. Um, Barrett's okay. I don't mind that quickly. You know, kind of the same story. They get decent usage uh, since they moved to this team. They've been a lot more involved offensively, but the prices are appropriate. Um, other than Barnes and Barrett, I'm not really getting to much. Maybe Bruce Brown kind of as a cheap differentiator flyer, like if Matherin's going to be 40% owned more, 40 <laughs> If his percentage is like 40 percentage points higher than Bruce Brown's, then I don't mind a sprinkling of Bruce Brown. Yeah, I think for me, it's mostly just Scotty Barnes. I think I had 10 games slate. There's a lot of different ways you can get value. Um, I think the other guys you mentioned are totally fine. Even Jakob Pertle at 6.3K, nothing wrong with that. I mean, I will say Bruce Brown's price at 4.4, it does look pretty inviting. But yeah, mostly just Barnes for me here. Uh, moving on, Suns and Mavs in possibly the game of the night. Really nice 243 total. The game is in Dallas. The Mavs are two and a half point favorites. Let me just double check how we're looking as far as health goes on the Phoenix side. Uh, Bradley Beal is questionable, which is somewhat alarming considering he's been off for like a week. And on the Dallas side, Luca is probable. Derek Lively is probable. And Maxi Kleba is probable. So Dallas is going to be at full strength beyond uh, Dante Exum being out. And Phoenix could be without Bradley Beal. So starting with the Suns, uh, what do you make of that? If he's in, it's hard to get too much. Um, kind of as usual with this team. Like, yeah, you can pay up for KD or Booker, but they're not cheap. KD's 10K, Booker 9.8. They would get more usage if Beal's out and would look more appealing, but even then... It's hard to prioritize them over like Luca if you're paying all the way up, for example. Um, Beal, fine, I guess, if he's in, but I'm a little concerned with the hamstring injury that tends to linger a little bit. If he's out, I guess Royce O'Neal and Eric Gordon would get bumps. Eric Gordon for 4A looks decent, assuming he would start. Um, I suppose Nurkic for 6 6 isn't the worst thing either. Dallas's interior defense has been lacking all season, but. They did beef up a little bit with uh, Gafford coming over at the deadline. So, yeah, I want to like this team because the game has a high total and a tight spread. But if Beal's in, it's going to be hard to make anyone like a core play on this team. Yeah, I agree completely. Obviously, if Beal is out, Devin is probably the guy that stands out to me here. He, there is just that narrative, Devin versus Luka. Devin comes – they both really come to play in this matchup. Devin had 46 real points the last time he faced the Mavs. So uh, I know we don't like to bind the narratives too much, but I kind of do when it comes to Devin versus Luka. I think they really get up for these games, you know, more so than others. So uh, KD always looks good. He's pushing for 50 fantasy points, even with Beal in. Uh, it's just the price is getting a little bit high. Um, and these guys have been at like 9.3, 9.4, 9.5 for weeks, and now they're both pushing up to 10K lately. So um, they just don't stand out as priorities. The good news is the Mavs are a pretty good matchup. It's got a great total, and nobody's going to be on these guys. So they are very interesting. And, well, I shouldn't say nobody's going to be on them. If Beal is out, people will be on them. Uh, but if Beal is in, I think they're still interesting contrarian plays. Uh, and I agree on Nurkic. I would just probably rather Beal to be out so I can just, you know, feel good about some extra usage coming his way. On the other side, you have, you got the Mavs. Obviously, Luka leads the way. 63 fantasy point projection right up there with Nikola Jokic on this slate. So are you – are you – are you going with Luca a lot? Are you going to go heavy ownership on Luca? Uh, are you going light? And how do you feel about the rest of the maps? I'm not going heavy. He's projecting for what? What's his ownership right now? Five. Yeah, I might be double that. So not like sure. extreme, but I will have him just because, you know, even on a 10 game slate, he's fully capable of breaking it. So. Uh, Jokic is the preferred option. I think he's in a much better spot against the Wizards, obviously. So I will have more Jokic, assuming he doesn't shit his pants like he did in the last game before the deadline. Um, but Lucas still looks great. 12 1. He's priced at a premium. Um, but like you said, uh, he tends to get up for these games against Booker. Uh, tight spread, high total here. I don't think Kyrie's a bad play either. 9K flat's not necessarily too much for him, but. Um, it's hard to really love him when Luca's in, especially if he's going to be pulling double the ownership of Luca. Mm -hmm. So at that, at that point, I'd probably just rather find a way to get to Luca, and that'll come at the expense of Kyrie naturally. Um, but other than those two, I don't think I'll get to anyone here. It's just a bunch of guys vying for minutes that don't do much. 
Yeah, the reality is when you look at a big slate like this, you don't need to go for these guys like Luka, but like Luka and Jokic, nobody really touches them as far as their ceiling goes. There's a lot of guys here that can get you 60-plus fantasy points tonight, but there's not a lot of guys who can get you 90 fantasy points tonight. Yeah. Luka's averaging in two meetings 80 fantasy points against the Suns. I mean, talk about getting up to play against somebody. He loves sticking it to Devin Booker, obviously. And I, uh, by the way, Luka and Jokic, quite well rested after whatever the fuck that was in the all-star game. <laughs> Just like dicking around, throwing lobs. and Yeah. Shooting. Did you see Luca get stuffed by the rim? That was fun. <laughs> Did he do that on purpose? No, I don't think so. He's I just not very. Be, I would not be surprised he's at not all. The springiest lad. No, he's not. But he's also like six eight, and I just he said he, I don't know if he was joking or not, but he said he was going for the seven 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 line. <laughs> just what a jackass. Anyways, I really tend to think both those dudes are just going to ball out tonight, but that's what they do anyway. So that's not anything new. Anyways, I'm with you. Uh, Luca, 12.1 is pretty steep, but he's got a 32.7 boom rating. He's he's right up there with Jokic with the best projection of the slate. He's not going to be owned. So I don't think you need him in a single entry lineup because I don't think you ever necessarily do on a, a slate this big. But if you're playing a lot of entries, I would go triple, quadruple the ownership here because he can break the slate very easily just on his own. Um, with you and everybody else, Daniel Gafford at 6K flat looks okay. What have his minutes been like, though? Backing up lively. I'm not really dying to do that. Okay, yeah, okay. So, yeah, he's not even in the starting lineup yet. I would have, I would, I'm a little surprised that they haven't made that move. Uh, but, yeah, so nobody else really stands out. It is Luka and Kyrie, and I do like Luka. I will definitely be overweight compared to the field if he's going to actually clock in at 5%. Moving on here, we have Boston and Chicago at the United Center with the 225 total. The Celtics are 7.5-point road favorites. Uh, I will point out – let's see, where is that stat – Actually, Gafford's projected to start. So. Okay, so yeah, I figured he, it was going to happen probably like right around the All-Star break, so it makes sense. Celtics are just 9, 12, and 3 against the spread as a road favorite. We know they are dominant at the TD Garden, but not really necessarily so much on the road. So it's just something worth keeping in mind. Um, but yeah, so who do you like for the Celtics? They appear to be at full strength. Let me double-check real quick. Yeah, they have Xavier Tillman in too, so they're at extra full strength. Yeah, so they have everybody. Uh, I mean, Tatum, Tatum stands out, but uh, how do you feel about Boston here? I just wanted to shout out your knowledge of team arenas. That was very impressive. United Center and TD Garden in the same utterance there. So. I was actually kind of afraid to say it because they change their sponsorship all the time with stadiums, especially yeah. football. So you United Center has been that for like that. You won't forever. catch me doing that when we start our MLB videos. I will not even dare, unless I like him really caught up. American Family Field for one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, no, I mean, for all I knew, TD Garden was no longer the name, but I just went with it. I think you nailed it. I think it's still the name. It was the. Still good. Something else before. I don't even remember. Um, this team looks pretty fadeable. Tatum, right. Brown, Porzingis. It's always the usual guys, but when they're all in, it's hard to make anyone a priority they're not priced necessarily all that attractively i guess porzingis maybe but you know he's got the lowest minutes ceiling of the starters um on this slate i just don't really see the need chicago is a very slow paced foe uh yeah um not much to say about boston honestly no, I'm in agreement, man. I think if you were going to play anybody, it'd be Tatum just for the ceiling. But with everybody there, his usage just naturally naturally is going to come down a little bit. And also, why play Tatum when you could play KD or pay up for mm -hmm. Luka? Or Yoke? Like, what what are we doing here? You know, or pay down for a Tyrese or Brunson or Maxi. Just there are better looking plays that stand out more. It does not mean you cannot have exposure to Tatum. It does not mean you can't play Tatum to get different. He still is pushing for 50 fantasy point projection. He just is not a priority. Moving over to the bull side, probably the same story because they're at full strength as well, I believe. Let me double check. Uh, Patrick Williams and Tor now Tory Craig is out. So, oh, we don't get that Tory Craig value. Uh, but, and obviously, uh, Lonzo Ball and Zach Levine are forever dead. Um, so, you know, there is going to be usage here, but it's mostly going to be dominated by Vooch, DeMar Rosen, and Kobe White. I will say there is a little bit of value here to consider. And also, what will they do with Andre Drummond for this game? So, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I don't think they'll start Drummond. They seem to do that against teams like the Cavs and the Timberwolves where they have two centers out there. Yeah, Boston starts Porzingis with Horford off the bench, so probably no need. Um, 
Drummond 6-1. Like, if he was starting, I would have a lot of interest, but I don't think he will for this game. I do have a lot of Vooch, which is not the most comfortable thing in this matchup. Uh, Boston, obviously, quite good defensively, especially around the rim, but 7-5 is a little bit of an underpay for Vooch without Levine. I think that's fine. Um, DeRozan, I guess, it's kind of the similar story without Levine. There's more usage for him. And to soon move 5K, I guess you can have a dusting of that. Um, just kind of as a mid-range value that's not going to be overwhelmingly popular. But yeah, it's really just Vooch and the others are just kind of randos to throw in every now and then. Yeah, I have no problem with falling on the big three here. I'm not going to like seek out the value for the Bulls, especially with Alex Caruso in. Um, but yeah, if there's one I would get away from probably, it would be Vooch because he's carrying ownership. A 16% owned against Boston. Ugh. Not like super excited about that, but if you're playing a ton of lineups, I mean the bull, the, all three of those Bulls guys get usage. They can produce, and like I said, Boston is not quite as dominant on the road. So maybe we have a closer game here than expected. All right, moving on to the Rockets and Pelicans in New Orleans. The Pels are seven point favorites. This game has a two twenty eight total. Let's check. A, well, Fred VanVleet is back. We know that Tari Eason is really the only guy worth mentioning out for Houston. As for the Pelicans, Brandon Ingram is questionable with an illness. I did not see if he was at shoot around or not. Do you know? I sure don't. <laughs> okay, so, hey, it, it appears to be up in the air. He still has the Q tag. That could change things. But obviously with Fred Van Vliet back, the Rockets do not look as appealing as they had been looking in recent weeks. But does that mean we have to cross them out of our player pool? Let us know. Mm, I don't see Ingram stuff, so who knows? As far as the Rockets go, I don't really see much. Uh, Van Vliet back should see normal minutes. I guess you could say 6-7 is a bit cheap for him, but, you know, not a good matchup against New Orleans. Pretty low total on the road. So I get Van Vliet, but not really going to get to a ton of him. Shangun, Jabari Smith, not necessarily too expensive either, but you know, this team is not in a very good spot. They're not very good to begin with. So doesn't look like the Rockets are going to be a big part of my night. No, probably not. I will say Shingun, um, he's smashed in this spot. In three games against the Pels, he does average 47 fantasy points per game. Obviously, past results don't necessarily indicate future results, but it's worth mentioning. He is a good price, um, and it is a good matchup of the numbers. The Pels are 26 against centers. Uh, I do love the Fred Van Vee. But Fred Van Beat, Fred Van Beat Price, but I don't really like the matchup necessarily. I think if I was going to go that low for point guard, I probably would just use Darius Garland. Uh, but he's totally in play, 6.7. He's totally fine. Um, and I would imagine FVV coming in uh, pushes Amen Thompson down at 6.5K. So I'm not looking at him like I had been in recent slates. All right, on the Pell side, obviously Ingram mean out would be massive. That would uh, spike the usage for Zion Williamson, CJ McCollum, maybe even JV, and it would open up value with guys like Herbert Jones and Trey Murphy. So let's play it as if Ingram is out. Who do you like the most if Ingram indeed is not playing tonight? Um, I like Zion either way. Uh, he'll be a priority for me on this slate. If Zion is, or if Ingram is out, then even more so. Um, Trey Murphy presumably starts or gets at least a nice boost in minutes. He'll be pretty good at 4-8. Um, Herb Jones is another guy I'll be getting to either way for 4-6. Just another Matherin pivot. Uh, minutes should be there for him in a competitive game. Not a big source of usage, but solid. Um, be fine. So okay with him for 4-6. Um, Colum, I guess, would get a bump at 7K, but he's not necessarily cheap. Um, a punt that I'm getting to a little bit right now is Jose Alvarado for 3-4. Just because he's 3-4, I guess he's bumping into some lineups a little bit. Um, minutes have been decent off the bench for him. Around 20 for 3-4, I think you can get away with that, assuming no better value pops up later. Um, yeah, I just think the difference between Ingram and Zion price-wise, like Zion's $500 cheaper, is enough to make him look like a core play for me today. Yeah, I would need uh, Ingram to be out to bite onto that. But I think, I mean, Zion at 7.8, that is a little bit too cheap for what he can do. Um, but I would mostly be looking at the value here. Herbert Jones and Trey Murphy look really, really good if Ingram ends up sitting. And, I mean, th they're viable. Weird on a 10-game slate, there's not that much popping value that you feel really, really good about. 
So I agree that they are in play regardless. Uh, moving on to the Clippers and the Thunder in OKC. Thunder are two-point favorites with a really nice 237.5 total. It's not exactly the best spot in theory. These are both pretty good defensive teams. Uh, but starting on the Clippers side, who stands out for you? This should be a good game to watch. Uh, right. Two awesome teams going toe-to-toe. But, you know, Kawhi's back. Missed the last game before the break. So kind of um, gives Jordan, <laughs> Jordan, Harden and George a hit there. Um, I guess George for AK is okay, but he could still be limited. He's been dealing with a groin injury lately. Uh, Zubac for 5-4 looks a little bit cheap for you know his normal production but minutes could still be shaky for him he was dealing with a cap injury for a while um all things considered i don't see a ton to like here no i mean if we can feel good about pg 13's minutes 8.8 k is a little bit too cheap for him i think quiet 8.7 is totally fine harden's fine i just don't see a priority here i think there's better plays on the slate uh, I'm with you on Zubac. 5.4 is a really nice price, uh, as long as we can also feel good about his role, too. On the other side, uh, other side there is the Thunder. Um, you got SGA up top with a 51-point fantasy point projection, uh, 21% boom rating. He is not projected to be owned, but he is 10.5K, and it's not a great matchup. So how do you feel about SGA, and do you like any other OKC guys? Yeah, I always feel inclined to play him but on this slate with those point guards we talked about in the kind of mid to low 9k range i think it's just easier to get to them especially with the sketchy value you mentioned um and the matchup's not great uh Mm -hmm. jalen williams might be my most exposed player here for 7k but nothing extreme as far as my exposure to him um holmgren you know low floor decent ceiling for 7-3 but not a priority at a loaded position on this slate either and that pretty much wraps it up. This game, while I want to watch it, I don't really want to play it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. By the way, Gordon Hayward makes his OKC debut, so that'll be something. So, you know, he might eat into some minutes there, probably mostly impacting Lou Dort, if anything. Um, Chet always looks good and uh, appealing with his potential ceiling, but he just has not been that dude lately for the most part. Uh, SGA is fine. I'm just I'm just probably not going to go here. I'm probably not attacking Thunder on this slate. All right, moving on. We have two more games here. Hopefully we can – oh, we're already went over 30 minutes. But, hey, 10 games is going to 10 games. Let's try to speed through here. we got Wizards and Nuggets. Nuggets are 14.5 point favorites at home. Game is a 231.5 total. Obviously, there's blowout risk. And I'm assuming you have no interest in the Wizards. But if that is incorrect, educate me. Uh, looks like I have some Tyus Jones. He's – Six one and okay, but not like I'm getting to a ton of them. I have them in around ten percent of my lineups as of this moment. Obviously, subject to change later in the day, depending on news. I think Bagley's okay for five three. There's obviously foul risk here against Jokic, but five three for a starting center, pretty good per minute guy. I don't mind that. And otherwise, this team looks fadeable. Yeah, I really don't have any interest. Denny Abdia normally would look good with his price is almost pushing 7k now so not really feeling that i'm with you on the the value for bagley but i don't like playing guys against Jokic, so i probably just won't uh yeah and that's it for me for the washington wizards because they are god awful on the other side Jokic has the best projection of the entire slate 37 boom rating he's also got the best matchup on the board the wizards are like literally 29th or 30th in every potential metric that would impact how Jokic plays here uh, so he looks awesome. The only downside with Jokic would be blowout, and he's going to be pretty owned, it looks like. So uh, what's your exposure to Jokic going to look like, and are you looking at any under any other Denver players? Yeah, I'll be getting to him quite a bit, just because the Wizards are like the nut matchup for bigs. He's cheaper than Luka. They have a comparable total to the Mavs. Um, Denver's at home. They should be on the right side of the game if it blows out. We know Jokic is so capable of putting up 60 to 70, even if the game gets out of hand and he doesn't play full minutes. So I think he's just cheap enough to get to. I don't think he'll be overwhelmingly chalky unless we get a lot more value popping later in the day. Um, So I will be getting to him quite a bit. Jamal Murray would be the other one for 8K. I don't think that's too expensive for him. Um, Another guy capable of putting up pretty good line. Uh, The Wizards are obviously a great matchup for pretty much everybody. So you can make a case for like Gordon and uh, Michael Porter Jr., but not priorities at over 6k a piece it's really just Jokic and murray with 
with a heavy lean to Jokic for me. Yep, 100% agree. All right, last game of the night, we got Hornets and the Jazz. I shouldn't say last game, but they, these, game, these, these two games are at the same exact time. Uh, but the Hornets are in Utah playing the Jazz. They are 10-point road dogs. This is a 230.5 total. It's kind of weird that the Jazz are ever almost 11-point favorites against anybody, but they have been pretty good offensively, and they do push the pace. And I feel like Charlotte has been a lot slower without LaMelo Ball. Um, but a couple notes, Jazz allow the most fast break points per game. They also allow the most three-point makes and are 28th and three-point percentage allowed. So honestly, it is a really good matchup for the Hornets here. Um, so I would not be shocked if this game stays a little bit closer. And personally, this is my favorite game to stack on the entire slate. So starting with Hornets, how do you feel? I feel gross, but they <laughs> look good. Um, Trey Mann for 5-5 five, five starting 30-plus minutes. Um, really not expensive enough for the role he's playing with this team. So mm-hmm. crazy to be tra- uh, paying 5-5 five, five for Trey Mann and thinking he's too cheap, but that's the way it is right now with this team. Right. Um, Grant Williams for 4-5 has been playing big minutes off the bench as a backup. Uh, high usage for him. It's Grant Williams. This could certainly come crashing down at any moment, but I do plan on having quite a bit of him tonight, it looks like. Oof. Famous um, last words. Power <laughs> forward center. Uh, Cody Martin, kind of the same thing. Four, six minutes have been pretty good for him lately since they made their trades. And LaMelo being out obviously helps him quite a bit too. So those are the three I'm looking to most. Um, Brandon Miller and Miles Bridges are the standouts, I guess, overall, but not dying to overpay for them on this slate. I think I'll just stick with the value uh, for Charlotte. Uh, yeah, I, I 100% agree. Uh, Brandon Miller coming off a 47-point fantasy outing in his last game, so he, he got out of a little funk that he was in. Before that, he was just wrecking. Miles and Brandon Miller have monstrous usage here, and Trey Mann's kind of cutting into that a little bit. Those are the three best plays in a vacuum for the Hornets, um, but I'm with you. I'm looking mostly at the value here because there's other spend-ups I would prioritize over Miles Bridges. But if you get to Miles and Brandon Miller, I have no qualms about that. All right, last team of the night, Jazz at home here. Uh, Lowry Markinen uh, is the one that stands out as the safest play with the best ceiling and best floor for the Jazz. Uh, are you playing uh, Markinen, and do you like any other Jazz here? doesn't look like I'm really getting to Markinen, but I am getting to this team a lot, um, which is, again, scary because they have a deep rotation and it's pretty unpredictable. But Keontae George looks like the chalk play of the day right now for 4-7. Starting minutes have been up going into the break. He's just too cheap. Um, I will likely be eating that chalk, even though it feels pretty nasty. The matchup with Charlotte does make me feel a bit better about it. Uh, Sexton for 6-2 I like quite a bit. Walker Kessler for 5-1 starting now since they traded away whoever they traded at the deadline. Um, So, yeah, (laughs) those two will be among my highest owned players, Jordan Clarkson. Guard forward eligibility is pretty useful for 5-7. He's been like above 6K most of the year, so it's a little bit of an underpay for him against Charlotte. Yeah, there's a lot of this team I'll be getting to. Markinen, not so much, but the cheap guards and Walker Kessler look pretty good. Yep, I'm in full agreement. I think it starts with Keontae George. He is going to be a pretty much lock for me across the board. If I was running 150 lineups, I might have 100% exposure just because it. I mean, he, you don't need him to get 54 fantasy points like he got in his last game. That isn't what we're playing him for. We're playing him because he's really cheap. He has an awesome matchup, and he's starting with a really nice role now. So if he gets 30 to 35 fantasy points, that's a win for me because he's going to be so chalky it won't even matter. All right, so that does it for the game-by-game breakdown. Real quick before we end this thing, let's look at the highest boom rating of the night and all these other guys that uh, we kind of touched on for the most part. But as far as the high boom ratings, who is somebody that you plan on building around more than anybody else tonight? Jokic, I mentioned he's my favorite spend. I plan to get to him north of the field. 23% is what they have him at right now. I'll probably be closer to 30. Not like double, but I will be over. Um Halliburton as well. I mentioned Cade Cunningham too. I think he's a really good, interesting mid-range tournament play. Yeah, I agree. I'm. Re- I mean, I'm in agreement with the system here with Jokic, Keontae, Luca, Halliburton, Trey Mann. All those guys look awesome. I mean, to me, that's like my core. Like right off the bat, those guys all look awesome, and it's always nice to see the DFS Hero Optimizer also digging them quite a bit. Uh, also, before we go, real quick, as far as high-owned players, there is some correlation between the ownership and the boom rating. But as far as the chalky guys, what chalk are you planning on fading or being severely underweight to? 
Uh, I think Evan Mobley looks a little shaky. I know I mentioned I like him for the dollar. He's underpriced for his role if he is really off his minutes limit, but that game's gross. It's one of the first games of the night. You know, I don't really need 20% Evan Mobley in my life. I'll probably be under the field on him just because it's a 10-game slate, and I don't really want to go over the field on the worst game of the night. Yeah, good call. I had mentioned that Vooch is probably somebody I'd get away from a little bit if he's going to be really owned, so that still rings true. The only other one I'll mention is Matherin. He is a good play at 4.5K, great matchup, but he's going to be crazy owned, 53% owned. I mean, he's got a really good boom rating. Everything looks good for him, but he is very scoring dependent. I know Aaron Neesmith is out, but I would just be a little bit underweight, I think. I don't know if I'd fade him if I'm doing a single entry, but if I'm doing a lot of lamps, I might go under maybe at like 30% or something. Or not 30%, but just uh, I'd just be under the field. All right, that does it for us. We ran a bit long. But, hey, first game back from the All-Star break, 10 games. That's what's going to happen. We appreciate all the views, all the subscribes. Uh, please like this video if we helped you in any way. And also, if you have not subscribed to the DFS Build, please do so so you can be alerted to future uh, episodes. And good luck, and we'll see you next time.